Hello everyone and welcome to Third Party Con. Hi there, I am Jason Bullman. I'm the Director of Game Design at Paizo, but you might not know that I'm also a third party publisher with a small imprint I call Minotaur Games. Today, I am excited to play Hopefinder with a, a, a talented cast of folks. I'm glad that you have decided to join me. Uh, Hopefinder is a hack of Pathfinder 2E. It turns Pathfinder 2nd Edition from a high spell-slinging, sword-swinging fantasy game into a modern zombie survival apocalypse game. And it's available right now on Kickstarter to fund a uh, print edition. I want to talk a little bit about the history of the game before we get going here. Uh, this is a game that I released in October as a PDF, uh, and I'm excited to be uh, putting it out there right now as a uh, crowdfunder to uh, support a print edition over on Kickstarter. I'll uh, make sure that we get a link uh, up here uh, for folks to check it out. So, uh, I think we should probably get started. I want to tell you a little bit about the world of Hope Finder before we get going. Uh, in the fall of 2022, the world came to an end. It all started in a farm in rural Wisconsin uh, when a parasite that would later come to be known as the Z Plague, uh, technically called Xynacol amoebic encephalitis, spread from a herd of pigs into the local populace. Within days, it had spread around the world. One of the farmers from that particular farm got on a plane and traveled to Seattle to visit some friends and family. And with him, he brought the infection, spreading it throughout the airports and finally into Seattle itself. Within a week, the, the parasite was around the world. Within a month, a billion were dead. And it was worse than that, because the parasite didn't just kill. It caused you to raise up and seek the flesh of the living. That's right, it's a zombie apocalypse. The year now is 2032. It is 10 years later. All of the world governments have fallen. 99% of the population are dead. Most of them have been risen up as the undead. And our story begins in Seattle in a small enclave called the Free Ballard Community. And uh, before we get started here, I want to go ahead and uh, bring our crew in. So, hey there, gentlemen. Welcome, welcome. Hello. Howdy. So before, before we get Hello. to introductions, I do just want to set the scene for the start of our, our little adventure here. Um, you are all in the smoke stop. It is the only really popular bar and watering hole in Free Ballard. And you, it is uh, late December uh, 2032. Uh, it's getting cold. There's a bit of snow on the ground, but not too much, which is pretty typical for uh, Seattle this time of year. The four of you are hanging out uh, in the bar, Carrie is behind the, uh, the, the bar serving up drinks. This time of year, she only really has one liquor on tap, and that's it's called Peppermint Rot Gut this time of year. And you're pretty sure it's just a kind of moonshine that she makes with really old candy canes. Um, it's sicklingly sweet, but it does get the job done. Uh, the four of you are hanging out here in the bar. Across from you is Dan, the man Thorpe. He is the perennial bar fly, knows everything, uh, and he is currently tossing back a drink. There's an old jukebox in the corner playing some Nirvana uh, because it is stuck in, you know, early 2020-somethings 20, 20 Seattle music, which so it's all Pearl Jam and Nirvana. That's all that's in there. Uh, <laughs> but it is it is playing low in the background and uh, the, the four of you are enjoying a beverage, uh, of course, of your choice. Um, and uh, that is where we're going to begin. That is how I'm setting the scene. There are, uh, strung about the bar, there's a, uh, a handful of really old Christmas lights, most of which are burned out, but there's just enough of them uh, that it does lend a kind of festive spirit to the air. So I'm gonna to toss it around the, t the, the, the table here and let folks introduce themselves and their character, and just say what you're doing uh, here in the smoke stop right now. Uh, Zach, we'll start with you. 
Yep. Well, uh, strung about Zach, the player to borrow a turn of phrase or some mostly burned out Christmas lights that I have now, <laughs> but, uh, I, I am on the podcast with these fine other folks here. I play a rat on it and a human in real life and a human in this game, um, swizzling his, uh, pepperminty swill with a half dissolved candy cane, uh, stands, a sallow featured green eyed, unkempt black hair, sort of tired looking gentleman who is just stooped over his drink all right all right so you're 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 hanging out at the bar just kind of drinking quietly sounds good sam um so i'm sam i'm normally the gm on um pot against the machine but here i am going to be a player that gets killed and today i'm playing uh a youngish, um, skinny kind of kid with patchy stubble beard that, um, if you look closely, uh, it's been artificially thickened with some sort of brown coloring. Uh, he's maybe about five seven, uh, 140 pounds, and uh, he's um, wearing just layer after layer of clothing. And he has um, a cup of this peppermint rot gut uh, that is definitely mostly water. And it's still like every time he takes a sip, it's just like... Mm. That's that's Romero. It it being the holidays, Carrie served you up a little nip, but just a little, and it is really <laughs> watered down. So it's mostly more like a, a peppermint water for you, but you know you get in the spirit, <laughs> and it's uh, still rough. Jero, <laughs> uh, I am Jero on the uh, regular podcast. I play a uh, grumpy old man, Kellid, and the world's oldest teenager. And uh, on this, uh, I'm playing uh, Martin Halloway. He is a very large and imposing man, uh, about six seven, just shy of three hundred pounds. Uh, older man, almost sixty, but not quite. Uh, long, straggly hair, uh, black, starting to gray. Uh, short, relatively well trimmed beard. And he's just kind of sitting, glowering over a glass, a glass of the uh, peppermint rock gut, and you see uh, like three empty glasses sitting behind it, and he's just kind of staring into it with kind of a hard look on his face. Fair enough, fair enough. So we've we've got a we've got a pretty motley crew of hard faced. Uh, 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 survivors and one kid. Uh, <laughs> Jeff, Jeff, why don't you round us out? Sure. Uh, yes. Hello. I'm Jeff. I play Asher on Pot Against the Machine, who's probably human and definitely a gunslinger. And today I am playing Chris Bridges. He's a string bean. He's he's six foot tall, but skinny as a rail. Uh, but unlike these other folk at the table who or at the bar rather who seem to be having you know an awful time you wouldn't necessarily know that it's a zombie apocalypse uh based on chris he seems like he's just having a great day drinking just the smallest amount of peppermint rocket uh but yeah he's he's just trying to you know cheer up the lads and like come on it's christmas time etc uh tis the season to kill zombies Blah, 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 blah. Uh, and uh, yeah, this that's Chris. All right. So the four of you are, uh, you know, in here kind of hanging out and you know each other, right? Uh, the the Free Ballard uh, commune is, is not incredibly large. There are several hundred people living here. But frankly, several hundred people, you get to know almost everybody pretty quickly. Um, and... Um, you know, Dan is here as well, and he gets up at one point in time and wanders over to the machine, and he's like, why the long faces? And then uh, starts playing some more Christmas music. Uh, there is one CD of Christmas music on here, but uh, it's it's not very good. Um, it's mostly covers. So uh, he starts playing that, and uh, uh, he comes back and sits down, and he's sitting next to the bell in the bar. Uh, and, uh, as, as he sits back down, he orders another round. And, uh, at that moment, the door opens and there's a bit of a brisk, cold air that comes blowing in and in walks a very tall man, big, bushy red beard, um, 
broad-shouldered. He's wearing um, what looks to be like um, a, a fireman's jacket, uh, but it's it's padded out. It's been patched like a dozen times. Um, and uh, he's got... Uh, you can even see, uh, as he walks in, he goes up to the uh, lockers. There's some lockers in the front. Uh, Carrie runs a, runs, a, runs a fine drinking establishment, but no guns allowed. The guns have to go in the lockers. If people get in a fight, she doesn't want anybody getting shot. So uh, the man walks up to the locker, opens it up, and puts an absolutely massive hand cannon in there. It is it is a gigantic gun. And he, he puts that in there, closes it, takes the key, and you all immediately recognize this man. He's known throughout the Free Ballard uh, commune. His name, you don't know his real name. Everybody just calls him Big Swede. And uh, he walks up to the, the, the bar and he's like, Ah, Carrie, give me some of that peppermint rock gut. I'm in a, I'm in a fighting mood. And uh, Carrie's like, sure thing. And uh, she goes back to the still uh, and, uh, and gets him a, 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 a shot of the liquor, which he downs. Uh, and he kind of looks around the place and he sees the four of you kind of on the other side of the bar. And uh, he comes on over and he's like, Hey! How are things doing, gentlemen? How how are how the how's the rock gut treating you tonight? Oh, a little non-dairy creamer, and you're in the spirit. How are you? <laughs> oh, you're you're risking the non-dairy creamer. Wow, you're braver than I. They haven't made that stuff in a decade. <laughs> but uh, I'm doing great. Doing great. Things are going pretty well. We got that hole patched up in the wall on the south side, uh, so things are things are back to back to back to normal around here. Uh, it's getting close to Christmas, though. I don't, I know you don't got a calendar, but take my word on it. We're almost to Christmas. Uh, and I was wondering if uh, if I couldn't talk to the four of you. I'm glad I found you here. I've been I've been looking for a handful of folks to help out with a little something. I checked the rosters, and you're all about due for uh for a trip. And here in Free Ballard, the way it kind of works is most people stay inside the walls of the commune as long as possible. But people have to go out on occasion. And if you're able-bodied and, and, and capable, uh, you kind of get put in a rotation. Uh, and, you, you're, you know, as long as you haven't gone out in the past month, you're kind of eligible. Um, and they can kind of, the, the commune will send out groups of people to accomplish certain things. It's kind of sharing the risk and sharing the reward. So when he says, you're eligible, that's what he means. Hmm. So he looks at you and he goes, yeah, we got a bit of a problem. And uh, well, four of you might just of be problem. the ones to help out. Sorry. No, go ahead. He says, listen, it's coming up on Christmas. And I, I mean, you know, the past couple of years have been okay, but frankly... Handing around the same comic books and dolls and, and blocks and stuff. Just kind of ain't cutting it anymore. The kids don't got a lot to look forward to this year. And this year's been rough, you know, when we when we ran out of fuel and things went dark there through the summer. It's been a been a long year. And uh we're thinking maybe the kids could use could use something a little special. Um and normally we wouldn't risk risk lives for something like this, but Frankly, morale's pretty low, so this is this is getting kind of important. Wondering if you might uh, help us out here. And this is Big Swede's approach. He always asks, but you know the answer cannot be no. <laughs> <laughs> so I was wondering if you wouldn't mind helping out. What do you think? Uh, <laughs> Romero will throw uh, back the, what's okay. left of his um, glass of mostly water and then cough like a kind of a lot. Like give me totally you know what go, cool. go ahead and give me a fortitude save as you try and down the rest of this peppermint rot gut romero is is how old are you romero how old do you look i'm 20 probably 20. look about 16 but um yeah all right <laughs> you I rolled a 20. natural 18 on that one an 18 so. all right yeah you you down it like a champ you're 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 <laughs> puffed up and ready to go and he's he's just like yeah i'm ready let's go you guys ready? Uh, I think uh, Martin will kind of look over at Romero and say, well, this definitely seems to be a good cause. Are we entirely sure that this is the 
best makeup for this group for it. Uh, how old are you? <laughs> I'm old enough. That's all you need to know. Big Swede pats you on the back and he's like, that's the spirit. And besides, you got GD here with you. GD's going to take <laughs> care of you real well. I'm not worried about it at all. Right, GD? Kind of slaps you on the back. And he just kind of stares at him and then looks back over at Romero and rolls his eyes a little, but he nods. <laughs> Danny, Chris, you in? I, I mean, uh, all the way. All the way, all the way. He starts jittering just a little bit. The uh, the milky rot gut spilling a bit out of the side of the glass. Yeah, you oh, don't yeah. want to waste any of that. <laughs> of course I'm ready. Got to bring joy to the kids. Good, good. I knew I, knew I could count on the four of you. So we got a little, little, little mission we want to send you on. I was talking to Ma Ballard, and uh, we, we chatted with Dan, and Dan just nods from across the bar. And uh, we were pretty sure that uh, the Pinecrest Mall, although it was used as kind of a, a bunker by folks in the early days, uh, after it fell, it's been pretty much left alone since then. Uh, we can't be sure on that. Folks might have raided it a bit, but it's a big place. And frankly, with all the stores and stuff in there, there's got to be some stuff for the kids in there. So we're thinking, go up to the Pinecrest Mall, grab as many gifts, toys that you can, and bring them back. That's it. If you find anything else useful along the way, I mean, you know, obviously grab it. Whatever can help the community will be great. But really, this is for the kids, so we want toys. Uh, any toys you can find would be great. Now, there's a bunch of... I don't know if any of you ever were there back, back before the fall... Uh, but uh, there's a bunch of kind of large stores on the outside. There's a Holman Castle. There's a Bullseye and a Halstrom. Those were kind of the anchor stores. Uh, the Bullseye might have some toys in it. It's probably got a toy department. I don't think Halstrom does. Holman Castle would be great to hit because it's filled with tools and stuff. So if, if, you know, if you got time, that wouldn't be a bad place to hit. Uh, but I think there might have been a toy store in the mall as well. And that's the thing you really got to go and find. I... I don't remember where, though. It's been a decade. So, you know, that's kind of what we were hoping you'd do. Obviously, you know, enjoy your evening. We'll send you out tomorrow. Uh, but as with all of our missions, you know, try and make it back in, in a day. Don't stay out overnight if you don't have to. All right. And uh, so we're going to be bringing back pretty much as much as we can carry of the toys so that everybody... Because, like you said, uh, I've been passing around the same thing for the last few years. Uh, we should probably try to grab enough to make a couple years' worth work out of this, right? I mean, the more you can get, the better. And frankly, if you find a good, you know, stash of toys and stuff, we can always send some folks back to get more later. Uh, but, you know, this will also serve as giving us a chance to know what's actually in that mall. Uh, like I said, they kind of used it as a bunker. Um, some folks tried to fortify it in the early days, but I think it fell before, like shortly before Christmas. So I'm going to guess that it's still pretty well stocked, but I'm not going to lie. Doesn't come without risk. We don't really know what's in there. And you know, there's definitely going to be some Z's in there. Any Z's. idea? <laughs> no big deal. Yeah, I knew you could handle it, Romero. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, I'm counting on it. <laughs> GD, you were saying? Uh, uh, well, I was just thinking. Uh, I'm sure Romero here can handle himself, but we have any idea how many people had been trying to hole up in there? Like, what are we looking at? Like a full horde of z's or just maybe a dozen or so wandering around the entire place dan pipes up and he's like yeah back in the day boy there were a bunch of people who went there to try to stay safe but uh i think it might have been a few hundred but they can't all still be there i mean if, if, if that place fell they probably wandered off years ago 
And then he shoots back more liquor. And then he rings the bell, and Carrie goes and pours another round for everybody. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they ran out of Cinnabons a long time ago. There's not, there's no reason for them to stick around. Uh, yeah, Big Swede uh, looks at you and he goes, "That's that's the attitude to take." I'm sure those those any zombies left in there were 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 driven out long ago. They, once the once the once the the pretzel stand ran empty, I'm sure they wandered off. <laughs> I mean, they want to eat flesh, right? And there's been no people there, so why would they stay? I mean, you and I both know that sometimes a horde will just stay motionless for months, if not years. So. We can't really know, uh, but it's been a long time, and there haven't been any people there in a while. So, well, all right. So you're in. Obviously, uh, you'll get uh, you'll get your day's food and water ration tomorrow. Uh, you know, uh, you can pick that up before you go. Uh, but other than that, you should be good. You should be set. I appreciate you thinking of us, big sweets. Sorry, big sweet. <laughs> I am pretty <laughs> sweet. I saw that. All right. Well, GD, you make sure to bring him home safe. He kind of slaps you on the back again. <laughs> yeah, don't He'll, you worry. Uh... We got Crypt Keeper here. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> He'll uh, nod kind of more serious than the people around him are. With that, Big Sweet goes to the other side of the bar, sits down next to Dan, and you the, the two of them have a have a conversation over a few more drinks as the evening winds on. So, um, we are gonna jump to the next day. And um so a few things uh, about Hopebinder as we get started. You'll notice, uh, for those of you watching, that we didn't really talk about what class everyone is. That is because Hopebinder is is a classless game. There is no, there are no character classes in Hopefinder. Everybody is their own kind of blend of survivor. They get to pick from a wide option of feats. And as we continue playing, you'll see how advancement works and how the characters kind of grow through uh, their experiences and through their backstories. One thing that we are going to do, though, is we're going to figure out everyone's starting challenges. This is an aspect of the game that kind of determines, uh, you know, what kind of state you are in the beginning. Because, frankly, no one in this world starts off perfect. You all have damage and, and your gear isn't in perfect shape. And we're going to go ahead and figure out what state you're in here at the start of play. So I'm going to go around the horn uh, and we'll start with uh, you, Zach. And I just want everyone to roll a d20 and tell me what you get. So, Zach, why don't you go ahead? All right, spinning the old digital D twenty. Well, I got a nineteen. Nineteen. That that's 19. not too bad. Uh, that means you are doing mostly okay. You start with uh one bruise, so go ahead and mark a bruise. You you've got a bruise from something. You've been healing up, but you 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 got a bruise. And too then, much creme de cane. I yeah, just that's right. Straight down. Yeah. And then uh, let's go ahead here and. Let me get to your gear. You are also starting with a ding. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and roll a d10 for your gear. And I got a, uh, let's see, that's a two. So your tool belt is taking a ding. Oh, no. Oh. Uh, which... Which, which actually is half of its break value. So your tool belt <laughs> is, a, is a little messed up. Fortunately, you don't have to make any checks with the tool belt. But if it takes one more ding, it'll be broken and you will you won't have a tool belt anymore. Which, which is no good because the tool belt lets you have more readied items. Um, so uh, right now you only got a crowbar on there, so it's not a big deal. You could always just move that to your readied items if you had to. But right now that's what you got going on. All right. Uh, Sam, why don't you roll for Romero and see what kind of condition Romero's in? All right. Oh, I got a natural 20. Both natural 20? You're all good. <laughs> nice. You're fine. That's the only <laughs> result in which you're all good. You you start off in great shape. All of your gear's in good shape. You just had it all repaired and fixed up, and you yourself are not hungry or bruised or anything like that. Now, folks at home might be asking, what's a ding? What's a bruise? Uh, dings are damage to your equipment. Every piece of equipment has a break value. If you have enough dings equal to half the break value, it's broken. If you have enough dings equal to a total break value, it's destroyed. 
bruises work like kind of long-term damage. Uh, it's harder to get rid of bruises. You have to kind of do specialized things like take aspirin or get cold packs to kind of get rid of bruises. And bruises eventually can accumulate to the point where you're starting to take penalties and are even knocked unconscious. It takes a lot to get there, but if you go a long period of time without treating them, you can end up in a bad space. So just so folks know, that's what that is. Uh, Jero, why don't we roll for Martin and see how Martin's doing? Yep. Bit lower than the last two. That is a 13 on the die. A 13 means that you're a bit worn. You need to do some maintenance. So you're going to start off with a D6 dings to your equipment. I'm going to go down here and get to your equipment chart. You don't have a lot of equipment, so we'll see how this goes. Um, no. You're only getting they two spent dings. a large percentage of my bar of my uh, barter score on armor, so I don't have too much other stuff. That's fair. You are wearing <laughs> biker gear, which is uh, pretty good armor. Um, so mm. I'm going to go ahead and roll. You have two dings. The first one is going to be to your biker gear. And the second one is also going to be to your biker gear. So your biker gear is a little dinged up right now. You've got two dings to your biker gear. Now, if you do find some some leather parts, either some leather armor or something else made of leather that you can take apart, you could get some parts and then you could use that to patch up your dings. But right now you're starting with two dings. All right, that is that. Now let's go to Jeff. Uh, why don't we roll and see what uh, what condition Chris is in? Uh, well, let's see, with a five on the die, I'm going to guess, uh, he dies and I'll be right back with a new character. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite that bad, but you're having a real rough morning. Uh, so you're starting off with a D4 bruises. Oh. Three. I imagine he's kind of, he said three? That's awful. Three. Uh, I, I'm picturing that he's just a little bit less of a lightweight than Doc Brown in Back to the Future Part 3. <laughs> yeah, he just he drank just that one sip and the next day he's just I, like, I don't even know what happened to me I, I'm gonna wager you wake up like you didn't you slept half out of the bed uh and and uh yeah you're just sore all over and you've got three bruises you may have fallen down the stairs um oh no and he's feeling a little bit of that cane pain that's how it goes and you also Uh, you also are going to have two dings to your equipment. Go ahead and roll where those are going to land. You don't have a lot of gear at all. No. Uh, so, uh, let's see. Your uh, pistol is taking a ding. Uh, and your bulletproof vest takes a ding. Okay. Not too bad. If your pistol takes... Uh, let's see, what's your pistol? Got a break of four? Yeah, you can still take one ding before it's broken. So you're, it's not too bad. Yay. This is... Uh, for any of you watching who have not listened to Potty and the Machine, I roll low. So uh, this is <laughs> this is on brand for me. This is par for the course. All right. Um, okay. So uh, we've figured out your starting condition. That's how all of you are. Uh, another thing that we track in Hopefinder is your hydration and your food. Now, the upside is you're being sent on a mission. They always make sure that folks getting sent on a mission are given to their full day's food. So for right now, you don't have to worry about it. If you eat all that, and I'm assuming you stay fully hydrated throughout the day and fully fed throughout the day, uh, if you stay overnight, you may have to find food. Otherwise, you'll start running out of food and water, which, you know, depending on how long you're out, may start causing problems. But for right now, you've got food and water. We probably won't track it, but we'll keep an eye on it should you get stuck or need to stay somewhere or something like that. All right. So it's the next morning. You're all up early. Well, all of you except Chris. The three of you gather down on the street of Ballard, and this is called Ballard Ave, uh, which is right, right near where the smoke stop is, kind of towards the north gate uh, in Ballard. Uh, and I'll probably show the folks at home the map of, of Seattle just to kind of give them a sense of where this is. Uh, the Free Ballard uh, kind of community is on the north side of the city uh, located in the Ballard neighborhood, which happens to be, funny enough, uh, kind of right where I live. So, uh, yeah, you, you, you're right where you know. Uh, and uh, that's that's the fun part about Hopefinder is setting it where you live. Um, so uh, it's early in the morning. You've all gathered 
Uh, Chris, I'm going to assume you're a little late. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is not like him at all. He's usually, uh, you know, right on time, but yeah, he comes in and his bulletproof vest is kind of like caught and he's trying to pull it down and straighten it. And he's like, sorry, I'm late. Uh, just a bit of a rough night, but ready to, you know, bring cheer to the little ones. He he kind of looks like death warmed over. Uh, you all recognize this. He does not look good. He, he doesn't look like he was in a fight or anything, but he definitely looks like he did not sleep well. <laughs> yeah, I can see the, the peppermint pain all over your face there, buddy. Uh, Martin, who today is, uh, yesterday I imagine he was wearing like blue jeans and kind of like a ratty t-shirt. Today he's decked out in like motorcycle gear with i imagine like the knees and the elbows are torn out that's what the dings are uh he's got a sledgehammer and a shovel kind of crisscrossed across his back and he looks over at chris are you are you sure you're good for today uh not to be too unkind about it but you look awful yeah, you want to talk, Grandpa? But uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. Sure, didn't sleep, you know, as great as I would have liked. But uh, sometimes when you're excited about a mission, you know, it just keeps you up at night. So, uh, Big Swede is waiting for all of you at the North Gate. <clears throat> if you do not have a backpack, he has one for you. Because they want you to bring back a bunch of toys and stuff. So they, they, they're providing you with a backpack to be able to do that. Um, nice. So if you don't have a backpack, go ahead and add that to your readied item list. Uh, one of the things that the Hope Finder character sheets do is it provides kind of a breakdown of where your stuff is stored. Ready items versus stowed items. Stowed items take longer to get out, but they're protected from harm. Uh, and when anything on you takes a ding, it generally hits your readied items first. Unless it falls kind of off the chart, then it might hit your stowed item. Um, so that's kind of how it works. Generally speaking, your armor has to get destroyed before your stuff in your backpack starts taking damage. Um, so you're all given a backpack and in the backpack are, uh, a couple bottles of water and, uh, a, a sealed mason jar filled with stew. Um, best not to question where the meat came from, but there is stew. <laughs> Allard hasn't had a rat sweet. problem is, recently. <laughs> is this, uh, yeah, I was going to say, is this ratatouille? Mm. It's fantastic. Mm. <laughs> Listen, the rats around here are very well fed. So, you know, That's they're true. of the highest quality. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you Nothing see any but cows acorns. around here? <laughs> <laughs> so, a little sniff of the stew tube and stow it in the back in the backpack. <laughs> so, uh you do have uh you know, plenty of room in the pack, right? You've got the pack has 20 spots in it, generally speaking. That means it can hold 20 things. So, uh, you know, make sure to, in the backpack, note that there are two bottles of water and a stew. That should take up two of your spots. So, um, uh, so there we go. Um, all right. Big Sweet is at the, the North Gate for you. The North Gate has kind of a big sliding door uh, that generally, usually takes two or maybe even three people to open. Big Big Swede can open it himself. He's a giant, giant dude. He's He's almost as tall as Martin. Um, uh, but he's very broad. The, the stories say that he used to be a fisherman, like who would go on like the Alaskan trawlers. Uh, and what happened to be in Seattle when everything went south, uh, and just kind of stayed because there is like a big harbor, uh, right nearby where some of the Alaskan fishing, um, well, used to uh, come and stay. Now it's just a bunch of rusted hulks half sunk in the in the in the bay. Um, Big Swede uh, goes up to the door and he says, "All right." Well, kind of looks down at his watch. Uh, about eight in the morning, you should be able to hike up to the mall and be there by noon. If you leave by, well, if you leave by sundown, you can probably get back before midnight. Uh, that'll be a little risky, but the area around here has been pretty quiet. Our scouts haven't really seen any wandering hordes lately. So, uh, you know, use your best judgment, though. If you're not back by morning, we will send somebody out to see if we can find you. Good luck. And with that, 
pulls open the door, which on rusty creaking uh, wheels, the door slides open. And there beyond are the streets of Ballard, beyond the kind of safety of the free Ballard settlement. You've been given a basic map to kind of lead you up there. It's not hard to get there from here. You pretty much walk east from here uh, until you hit the I-5, the ruins of the I-5 freeway, and then you kind of walk along the freeway heading north. You really can't get lost because the mall is right off the freeway to the north of you. So I guess then there's there's no chance of a survival roll shaving any time off our trip. Um. <laughs> Actually, in fact, there is a chance of a survival mm -hmm. roll saving some, shaving some time off your trip because there are a handful of different ways you might take. Um, you know, especially considering this area, some of the roads are kind of impassable, right? You know, uh, when everything went south, um, you know, during the fall, um, some of the major roads became so clogged with cars um, and debris that they're kind of impassable and you have to kind of wind your way through back alleys and stuff to get through. It's mostly residential, but even then some places tried to wall up and use cars and stuff as barriers. So like the area out here is kind of a disaster zone. Um, it also doesn't help that nature has started to reclaim some area, right? The streets have slowly been overgrown. Um, and in some places, Thickets have, have started. Well, there are a lot of blackberry bushes in Seattle, and in some cases, those things will just grow wild if allowed to. So there are areas that are just like, oh, no, don't go that way. You'll end up having to double back because it's all blackberry bushes, and you don't want to cut through them. Um, that's way too much effort. So um, in that, uh, Chris can go ahead and make a survival check if you want. So, yeah, he'll, uh, he'll take a look at that map and say, I wonder if maybe we couldn't get there in three and a half or something all right uh that is a total of a 17 17's pretty good you know that the best way to get there is going to be to actually go a little bit north from where you currently are you're going to want to go north up to 65th street uh and you'll take 65th east as opposed to just kind of going straight east out of ballard kind of along market ave if you take 65th, you'll kind of run into the zoo and the road along the zoo is mostly open. Whereas if you kind of just go dead east, you're going to run into a whole bunch of cars and traffic and uh, not, not that there's real traffic, but you know, a whole bunch of <laughs> obstacles. Sweet. So uh, that will definitely shave at least maybe, maybe as much as half an hour off. That uh, He feels better uh, relaying that, knowing that he was a little bit late this morning. <laughs> you save so you a little can, bit of time. Back. You can make All up right. for that a little made bit. Up for the lateness. All right. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the group of you uh, shoulder your packs and head out. You make your way north a bit, uh, and and mind you, it's like ten blocks north. You get to sixty fifth, so that's that's not much of a. Walk. And uh, then once you're up to sixty fifth, you just kind of start heading east. You continue making your way east and eventually cut your way through some residential districts until. Uh, after about, it's been about an hour, hour and a half now, you make your way to the I-5 freeway. Uh, now, this is not a raised freeway. This is a uh, this is a surface level freeway. Um, but as you kind of approach it, there's, there's like large embankments coming down from the neighborhoods to this freeway, which is a little recessed. Um, it is completely choked with cars from top to bottom. Even, even on the embankments, there are cars and in the side streets running along it. However, despite all of this, it's still kind of the quickest way just to go north uh, because there are there is kind of paths along the embankment where the cars couldn't get, and those are convenient walking. So um, you can kind of easily make your way north from here. Um, you don't really need to dodge anymore. There's a couple spots where you have to kind of clamor over some cars and stuff, um, and... Uh, as you get closer to your final destination, uh, you reach the point where the light rail uh, lines uh, kind of come up. And there's a point here where they have entirely collapsed, um, the old light rail lines. And the, you find yourself at a spot where you have to kind of scamper over some embankments and some, some cars here to kind of get through. Now, there's a couple ways you can do this. You can do this 
via athletics. You can carefully climb over things. You can do it via acrobatics by kind of nimbly just jumping around doing things. Um, or if you've got some other uh, brilliant idea, like if one of you has rope or something like that, you might be able to help others get across. But in any case, you're going to need to make some checks to get over this. Uh, if you fail, you're probably not going to die or anything, but you might get a bruise or two. So that's where we're at. Um, how do you want to approach this 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 challenge as you kind of make your way over this pile of rubble? I think uh, Martin will kind of look around the rest of the group and says, is uh, everybody okay just climbing over this or what are we doing? Any of you think to bring, uh, say, rope or anything? Uh, I didn't myself, but anyone else have anything? You know, looking back, rope would have been a good choice, but um, I think I'm good with just climbing, personally. Same, same. I'm happy to go first. All right. Well, it sounds like folks are just going to scamper on up and over it. Mm -hmm. Um, So we'll start with you, uh, Danny, because you said that you were going to uh, go ahead and go first. If I had that right. Was that you, Danny? Yep. All right. That is correct. Uh, just double check in here. Uh. All right, so uh, Danny, why don't you go and give me either an acrobatics or an athletics skill check, your choice. Oh, uh, Google was not as kind. I rolled a seven for a 12 on my acrobatics. A 12, okay, so that is going to be a failure. So you're gonna take one bruise as you kind of scamper up and over this thing. And on the other side, you, you almost made it, but then you kind of slid down and landed hard on one of your arms. Um, so you, you end up with a bruise. So go ahead and mark yourself with one bruise uh, for yeah. that. Not too bad. That is not a load-bearing Mazda Miata, by the way. It's a rag <laughs> all the way through. Yeah, at this point in time, there isn't much left of it, and uh, your elbow just went through what was left of the windshield. Um, all right, who's going next? Uh, I think uh, Martin will go up next. All right. He'll say, did, did anybody hear that? Let me go check on him. And he will uh, climb over with athletics. Uh, that is a 16 on the die for a 21. You make it over easily. And yeah, he just like hand over hand, just brute strength his way over and checks on Danny on the other side and probably grumbles at him for falling and hurting himself. Sure. Um, yeah, you're able to easily kind of scamper up and over to the other side. Uh, you know, here and there, the footing was a little un unclear, but, you know, with your, your build and your athleticism, you were able to eat. And yeah, you're able to join Danny. He He's not too rough for wear, but he, he did clearly take a bit of a... Who's next? I could just skimper on over. All right. Just like, uh, just like playing basketball or something. <laughs> sure. Roll, roll yeah, just like that. Acrobatics. All right. Uh, that's kind of middling. A sixteen total. A sixteen is enough to avoid any serious harm. Uh, you you're able to kind of scamper up and over, and and although you lose your footing a bit in one spot, you recover nicely and uh and make your way over without taking any harm. No problem. So that just leaves Romero. Right, and with all the exuberance of, of youth, he's going to try to scramble on up over these cars with acrobatics. Oh, 17. No problem at all. You've all you've all managed to make it over without too much trouble. Only only Danny took a bit of a, of a bruise. But Romero, you're able to easily kind of climb from car to car and kind of hop from here and there and land the other side with, with a small amount of panache, just a little. <laughs> Enough to enter Panache, so I can use my No, 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 no. You're not a swashbuckler. All right. Uh, wrong game, wrong game. <laughs> All right. So, uh, you've made it over the kind of pile of rubble. <clears throat> and on the other side, you are now looking toward the Pinecrest Mall. Uh, crossing this hill of debris and rubble, the mall is now visible to you off in the distance. You're probably still a block or two away from the large parking lots that surround it. The parking lots are, are choked full of cars um, and, and trucks and stuff. Um, just like a standard mall, um, it's got kind of cars and trucks all around it. 
uh, and large parking lots. Um, there is not a, there, there looks like there was a parking structure on one side, but sometime in the past 10 years, it collapsed, um, and is just a giant pile of rubble, uh, with broken bits of metal and car sticking out of it. So that's definitely a no go. Um, but looking at it just from a distance, you're kind of approaching from the, from the, the, the South, um, you can see what looks to be like a large kind of department store anchoring the south side. Um, it looks like there might be another one to the north side. It does not look like there is one to the west side. The west side looks like it has the main entrance, uh, which is uh, enters from the large parking lots pointing at the freeway. Um, so the, the mall kind of runs north-south mode. Um, and do we see the uh, marquee on the southern department store like which one that is it it looks like the southern department store is called halstrom um it's it's a little hard to see from this distance uh mainly because none of you have had good vision care in a decade uh but <laughs> um you you think that's what it says um uh, the sign uh isn't lit up or anything there's no power here obviously the the power went dark a, a decade ago there's power in free ballard sometimes uh but 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 here there's there's um, so you can just yep. approach the place. I kind of want to know what you want to do at this point. Do you want to just walk straight up to it? Do you want to circle around mm -hmm. it and kind of get a lay of the land? You can kind of approach this however you want. That's one of the lovely joys of Hope Finder is, uh, the adventures are pretty free form and, and frankly, how you want to approach it, uh, is, is up to you. I think, uh, uh Dardown, Danny Polly is going to pull out his pocket pistol and, uh, <laughs> check the clip put it back in his hand um <clears throat> everyone ready to shop till we drop uh looks like the uh that closest entrance is uh the one of the three that big swede said would be the least useful to us i wonder if we should circle around to one of the other ones also uh might want to just do a full circle of the building before we go in, make sure there's not any, you know, gangs or anything hanging out here still. I know he said they're gone, but you can never be too careful. Yeah. Well, I hear the Raiders went from Oakland to Las Vegas, so should be pretty clear. But might as well. Let's don't burn too much daylight. All right. Uh, well, you can easily walk around the place in about a half an hour, uh, which, you know, still puts you at about noon. Um, so you walk around the place and you're easily able to kind of tell that the, 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 there's a very large anchor store on the North uh, side of the mall that is home and castle. Um, home and castle is a, uh, sort of, um, cross between a, a home decorating place where you're going to go and find pillows and sheets. And, uh, but it also has, um, like part of it is also construction and renovation. So there's going to be timber and tools and that sort of stuff there as well. Uh, they're, they're kind of kept separate, but they, they, they're all in the same store. That's, that's home and castle. Uh, and then when you circle all the way around and you get to the west side, or sorry, the east side of the building looking west, um, you see uh, the bullseye uh, department store. And that, that is kind of your, your discount uh, shopping place. It's mostly clothes. They might have some food. They probably have a toy section. Um, but it's not going to be an extensive one. It's going to be small for like your kind of department store kind of toy section. Um, different than kind of a full-blown toy store. Um, so that is a possibility as well. It also now, now that you've circled all the way around, you can tell that uh, the mall is two stories in the center. The The satellite stores, or sorry, the big box stores on the outside are probably one story. But the middle of the mall is definitely two stories tall. It looks like the, the second story has a movie theater in it. Um, because on the outside, there's something that says pick three and has a little film reel. Um, you do know that uh, back in the Free Ballard settlement, um, they're desperate for new movies uh, because they managed to recently get the, the, the Majestic uh, uh, movie theater back up and running. But the only films they have are what was out in October 2022, which let me tell you, mm. 
It's not a good list of movies. All right. So, <laughs> yeah, nothing really good there. So if we can find some like digital film reels from that, that could be something to bring back too. That would be a really big deal. Um, and also, it looks like the second floor has a food court. Oh, which that could have like non perishables in it or something. It might. It might also have a bunch of food that went bad 10 years ago. Who knows? <laughs> Anybody want some decade old clam chowder? I don't think you do. <laughs> so want those little samples from the Chinese food place that all still when those clam chowder gets better with age. <laughs> yeah, it, it does. This is it's a fine aged clam chowder. All right. Uh, can I also get? Um, can I get everybody to roll me a perception check? Uh, that'll be a fourteen. Fourteen. All right. That is a 19 with a 14 off the die. All right. Uh, mine is also a 19. All right. Coming in hot with a dirty 20. All right. So uh, every every one of you who succeeded uh, revealed one of the ways in. So there are a couple different ways in. You have discovered three of them in your search. Um, and you discovered that there is apparently... Um, so it looks like as you make your way around, there are several entrances to the mall. Unsurprisingly, there's a lot of doors going in. But it looks like all of the major doors leading into the central part of the mall are barricaded and blocked. In some cases, by stuff on the inside. In other cases, by like cars and vans being pulled up to the front to serve as a barricade. In some cases, they even knock them on their side to serve as a wall. Um, so it's clear that whoever tried to hold up here did their best. But that said, not everything held. So on the very north end of the mall at Homan Castle, there is uh, the, the main entrance to Homan Castle on the north side is completely blown open. It looks like somebody drew a truck through it at some point in time. And probably more recently, like someone drew a truck through it in the past couple years, not 10 years ago. So hmm. this might have been the Raiders breaking into the place by ramming a car through a barricade. Um, so that looks open. On the east side of the mall, south of the bullseye, it does look like there is an opening. Um, uh, one of the openings into the mall itself looks like it's been broken open. And last but not least, you manage to spot on the, on the uh, west side of the mall, there is what looks to be like a service door. You're not sure where it goes. It doesn't look like it goes directly into the mall. It probably goes maybe into service crawlways or backways um, or offices. You can't really tell. It goes somewhere, but there is a door that's like gently swinging open uh, kind of on the west side of the mall. So that's what you see. Um, you have also, by the way, you did also spot a couple crawlers in the parking lot. Uh, but... They're crawlers, so you don't even really have to deal with them if you don't want. They don't move fast enough to catch you. They, they're they really Which, only dangerous uh, when you're cornered. <laughs> entrance were they closer to? Uh, like, they're actually just kind of, of in the... You actually just spotted them in the parking lot. Um, there's some on the okay. west side. There's some on the east side. There's not many. Okay. Um, uh, maybe you spotted half a dozen total. Uh, but they're crawlers. Okay. Again, unless you decide to sit still and have a picnic, they're not going to catch you. See? This is what happens when you pave paradise. Anyway, <laughs> I saw a little door, kind of, I'm not sure where it goes, but it's kind of swinging open a little bit, and it seems like the less obvious one, you know, it's not quite big, someone drove a car through, or maybe broke it open, but Raiders, could be, a, be an interesting way to go in, do a little exploring of the offices, get some more staples, you know, Ma Ballard's always... Want more staples? So I, I will say this. That that entrance is kind of furthest away from all of the big box stores, right? Because it's on the it's on the west side, whereas the big boxes are on the north, the south, and the east. So um mm. that's I don't know if that changes your consideration or anything, yeah. but I'm just telling you that's yeah. kind of the south. So uh that may be the safest way in, but once we're in, it's the longest distance to try to get to anywhere. Uh, 
it may be obvious, but I think just going into home and castle seems like it would maybe make the most sense. We can check if there's anything that hasn't been looted out of there yet. Supplies, things to uh, help fortify up the settlement more, and then we can move further in. I mean, I don't hate that idea, uh, but at the same time, you know, just to play devil's advocate about the West entrance, we have to find that toy store and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking for something too. So we, we don't really know where everything is inside the mall. I, I didn't spend a lot of time here. As you can tell, I'm not really from here, but, um, what do you, what, what do you think? Uh, the two 10 year olds in a trench coat, he looks over at. Romero Valentine. <laughs> you said you're 20, right? That's how that works. It's like two 10 year olds in a trench coat. Yeah. I'm here for business. Yeah. <laughs> um, we were more of a, a crosstown mall kind of family. So um, I don't know if I've ever actually been here, but um, maybe we split the difference, go in by Bullseye. Um, and that they, they might have a some of the toys they might have uh if they got a sporting goods section maybe they got guns and ammo that kind of thing though i guess if raiders have been here that's probably all long gone so we got a lot of uh differing opinions uh there's talk about going in near the home and castle there's talk about the door that is south of bullseye it's not in bullseye it's to the south of bullseye that looks like it goes into the mall itself um, and then there's this strange access door that who knows where it goes. Um, that's, that's kind of your options before you, you're kind of sitting here talking about it, but daylight is burning. So which way are you going to go? And you were pretty clear at the outset when confronted with something like this, we should all take individual routes because you want to balance <laughs> all four of these, right? Yeah. Every Everyone Split knows the party as much as possible. <laughs> everyone knows that in the zombie apocalypse, the smartest move is to go in as many different directions as possible. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yes, that is definitely <laughs> the thing you should do. Uh, because you know we're we're an hour into the stream now, and it'll make sure that this wraps up nice and tidy. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll all be dead within the next hour. Yeah. Exactly. So anyway, it'll be yeah. it'll be fine. We'll have to play for time. <laughs> <laughs> so where do you want to go? I don't uh, feel too strongly. Maybe we could flip a coin. Flip a coin a few times. I don't know. Anybody have a six sided cubicle object we could roll and <laughs> yeah. determine? I'm just saying, I think like I, as a player, I really like the idea of that like little door that goes off to somewhere mysterious. I just feel like Martin wouldn't think that was a good idea. So I'm kind of split even within myself on this one. The, the upside is if you do go home and castle. There, you might be able to find tools and stuff to help you, right? Yeah. Um, there's a good chance it's been picked over, but maybe they didn't get everything. Just nothing. You but know, I think Martin is. Uh, I think Martin is actually just going to kind of square his shoulders and start walking towards Home and Castle and just assume that everybody's going to follow him. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all salute. <laughs> Single tear as he walks away. Yeah, no, let's go. That's it's, it's good enough yeah. for me. All right. So uh, you begin making your way north uh, to the home and castle. Uh, you kind of cut uh, through the corner of the parking lot and kind of come at it from the north side. Uh, soon you are approaching the kind of cavernous opening where there used to probably be like, you know, four double doors next to each other. Um, this car smashed through it, blew the whole thing in, and now it's just kind of an open cavernous hole. It is pretty dark in there. Uh, but it's daytime outside, so plenty of light is spilling in from the outside. But it is pretty dark. Do any of you have any light sources? Does it, Did any of you get a flashlight or anything like that? Oh, I've got a flashlight. I don't think so. Nope. It's hard to carry a flashlight and a rifle at the same time. But <laughs> All right. <laughs> Stow the rifle on his back and, and take out the flashlight, I think. Does right. the jar of stew glow and give off <laughs> any illumination? <laughs> no, if you, no if, but if, strangely if, enough, the water does. <laughs> well, if you got water from down near the stadiums uh, here in Seattle, uh, they they did nuke them during the fall. They dropped a tactical nuke on zombies that they had corralled inside one of the, the, the football stadiums. Uh, 
Uh, and, uh, yeah, the South part of Seattle got pretty messed up by that, <laughs> but, but you're far enough North that you get water out of the Puget Sound. So it's fine. It's not glowing. Uh, it's, it's okay. Um, so, uh, that said, fortunately, uh, uh, looks like, uh, Romero does have a flashlight. So you break out the flashlight, um, and, uh, you're able to kind of light your way as you enter the mall. The first thing you kind of see is one of these box kind of kiosk things. Um, not not that there's people in it, but just like a, a box tower that has the map of the mall on it. Um, and normally these things have the mall and then below it they've got another glass pane that has the store directory. Unfortunately, the store directory here has been shattered um, and is in a million pieces on the floor beneath it. But you are able to see the mall itself. So this is the Pinecrest Mall. You're looking at the map, uh, and you are up here uh, near Home and Castle. So I'm going to go ahead and put a token down for you. There it is. That's going to be your survivor token here for the game. Uh, and you are at the north end here, right near the Home and Castle. Um, you've just come in through the, kind of the north entrance. This is exactly as the map appears. So you can see that Homan Castle uh, is here. Halstrom is here. Bullseye is here. North here is to the the, the left. So it's not, not a great map for, for knowing north and south. Uh, it's a mall map. So uh, that is north. North is towards Homan Castle. Halstrom is to the south. So um, looking at this map now, you now realize that the door that you saw that was open leads to an area called Admin. Um, that's where that door is. If you see that little door uh, to the uh, north, on the north side of the Admin, that's the door that you saw that was open. Um, then, in addition, the other door that's open is down near whatever S is between S and 7. That's the other entrance. All right, so you've, uh, you've entered the mall uh, at the north end, uh, there is, you're looking out in kind of to the darkened, uh, uh, home and castle, uh, department store. The, the place that you're at, you can kind of go to one side, which is tools and lumber and, and, and all that sort of stuff. And then the other side, which is like home improvement. It's stuff like toilet seat covers and towels and stuff like that. So that's kind of what you see. But even from here, you can tell this place has been pretty ransacked and your flashlight um, shows you that a lot of the shelves are pretty bare. Like you do see like, oh, there's there's a rack full of screw bits, um, which is useful if you have a, you know, powered, you know, <laughs> uh, drill or something, right? Um, but you don't. So <laughs> you do see stuff like that, but you can, you can enter and start looking around. Um, you know, you don't see any threats immediately. I think, uh, as Romero is about to kind of start walking in, I imagine with his light, uh, Martin kind of throws a hand in front of him to stop him and he'll, uh, kind of step forward and turn around and look at everybody and say, now, uh, I know some of you have been in dangerous situations like this before, but we don't know what we're going to run into in here. If there's still anybody left alive or worse, if there's people in here who aren't alive anymore. And I just want to offer a uh, couple of tips as far as dealing with them. Uh, I know some of you might know uh, that... Uh, I was in what you might call show business uh, before everything went down. And, well, my uh, bit of my gimmick when I was, well, when I was a wrestler was to, they called me the walking corpse. Uh, when people would, they'd hit me with everything they had and I wouldn't go down. And you see, the real trick to that is you don't actually get hit. I still remember my last match uh, about two years before everything went down. It was me against uh, CJ Elegance. Uh, oh, good oh, kid. Oh, 
Oh, so is are we doing your flashback? Is that what's happening? Yeah, that is that is fantastic. Okay, so for for everybody for everybody watching this, uh, this is a narrative construct that happens in Hopefinder. Flashbacks are moments where we go back in time, talking about the character's history and past. So, uh, uh, Gerald, why don't we set this up like a scene? So. Yes. This is in the middle of some sort of wrestling arena, right? So there's crowds cheering. Yes. There's there's people yeah, screaming. There's, uh, and for a moment, in, there's that's a lot where of we are. people. Uh, yeah, and you see uh, throughout the crowd, there's a bunch of people that are holding up big signs that say "Thank you, Taker." Or no, oh. there are a bunch of people holding up big signs that say "Thank you, Digger." And uh, I'm standing in this arena and everybody is chanting and across from me is standing cj elegance uh who is mm. in I, I say up and comer but been in the business about a decade uh about a foot shorter than me but much more acrobatic a uh, very flashy wrestler and so he's, a lot of this, tassels. This is the type. Colors. Yeah, he's obviously covered yeah. in a suit that has like sequins and tassels, uh, and came mm. in uh, probably being carried on a on a chair yeah. by like four <laughs> servants who carried him up to the ring, and he mm. he kind of daintily climbed up over the ropes to be in the ring in front of you, uh, and yeah. and generally speaking, got booed. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Uh, everybody is kind of just. They don't care about him. They're all paying attention to me. And I'm just standing there, have my head down, have this big, long coat on. And you just hear like the sound of a gong. And I suddenly look up and uh, CJ, for what is worth, he really kind of puts on the show. He takes a step back like he's frightened a little bit, but then he kind of grits his teeth and he runs in and goes for a clothesline. And from what the audience sees, he hits me on with like dead across the shoulders, but he bounces back and I just stand there. And what the audience doesn't see is him give this little nod right before he does it. And me adjusting my footing and just taking the hit in a way that it's not going to knock me down and that he's not going to be hurt either. And we continue to go on like this. I grab him at one point and choke slam him, but I let go early enough that he's able to kind of bounce against the bottom himself. And just the whole thing in the business, we call it the dance. And you just do it so that it looks like you're getting, you're beating the tar out of each other. But at the end of it, while you both might be exhausted, you're not really hurt. And that's, kind of the thing like even in a real fight against something like these zombies or something you gotta make it you take the hit in a way that you don't really take the hit and we come to the end of the match and CJ goes off the top rope and goes to try to get me in the chest with his boot like just like a flying drop kick and I go back a step which for the real reason i do it is so i'm not getting hit but i time it just right so that to the audience it looks like maybe he really did stagger me and i'm gonna go down but then he f hits the ground and i'm still standing and i go in for the pin and everyone is just cheering <laughs> and then i imagine like we cut back from that to yeah. me telling this story to and and that's basically how you do it you have to roll with the punches you take the hit in a way that you're not really taking the hit so, and you'd be surprised what you can make it through <laughs> so flashbacks in the game serve as a way to kind of illuminate the characters backstories they all have rich backstories but we don't necessarily just reveal them as part of the character introduction instead they get revealed through these flashbacks so here we just learned that Martin used to be a pro wrestler called Gravedigger, <laughs> uh, and uh, he has a lot of skills at being a pro wrestler. Now, what this also does during Hopefinder is it unlocks a flashback feat. 
These advanced feats, you get one per session because you get one flashback each session. So uh, Martin uh, here is going to be gaining a new feat. Jiro, what feat do you get? So he is gaining the feat Agile. All right. Which allows him, if he takes the dodge action during combat, which is a uh, reaction that you can take uh, in uh, response to somebody trying to hit you, yeah. he gains a bonus to his uh, armor class. And on top of that, if the bonus isn't enough and he still gets hit, until the end of the turn of the thing that hits him, he gets a plus one to his AC. Yeah, so normally in Hopefinder, all characters can take the dodge reaction if you're attacked um, by a melee attack, and you can see the attacker, you can attempt to dodge as a reaction and give yourself a plus two bonus against the triggering attack. Uh, uh, Martin is agile, particularly agile from his days in wrestling, and learned how to more effectively dodge the attack, and he gets a plus three instead, and if it still hits... He gets the plus one until the start until the end of this creature's turn. So it's really pretty handy. Yep. So if they have to if they swing again, then he gets yep. that extra little plus one for their next iterative hits. Exactly. So Martin has uh 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 talked to all of you about his flashback. Um generally speaking, every character is gonna get a flashback. We're gonna probably play this session over two uh breaks, so we'll see how many flashbacks we get to here today, but the other ones will happen in the second part. Um but uh, there is that one. So uh, you're still standing at the entrance to this home and castle. Uh, and basically, I'm kind of curious, what do, you, what do you do? Are you just trying to push your way through? Do you want to explore a bit and maybe take a look around? What are you, what are you thinking about? Chris? Um. <laughs> I was going to say, Chris has the scrounger background. And so his, he's kind of in his element a little bit, hoping to find something useful that maybe got overlooked. And uh, the fact that we have one flashlight among us is awesome, but ideally he uh, would try and spend us a little bit of time to see if maybe we can't get another light source or two that was left maybe behind the counter or something, just, uh, just to have a backup in case Romero's breaks or something. All right. Yeah. So, uh, sounds like you're looking to search. Is everybody kind of joining in on that, taking a look around? Sounds yeah. reasonable. Yeah, that sounds good. All right. Yeah. So, um, the group of you starts looking around here, and uh, we'll uh, we'll go ahead and bring back up this, and we'll go ahead and just move your token uh, over here. You're kind of going into the store proper and taking a look around uh, here in the mall. Um, you start uh, kind of scavenging around the place. Um, you can, uh, let's see, you can make, I want to say perception checks would probably be good. Let's see some perception checks as you kind of make your way around and are taking a look uh, throughout the place trying to see what you can see. Just a 13 here. Two for a seven. <laughs> All right. 17 for a dirty 20. Ooh. Thank you. Yeah, only a 15 total for Chris. So sorry, uh, Danny got a, a 17, is that correct? Uh no, no Martin. Oh, it was Martin. Okay, sorry. I got I got yeah. turned around. Um <laughs> all right. So so Martin got a 17 and uh Chris got a 15, did you say? Okay. Yeah. Um so uh you start casting around and um Chris, you managed to find a uh, flashlight uh, that is indeed behind one of the uh, uh, desks. Now, it doesn't look like it's in very good shape. And in fact, uh, the batteries for it don't appear to work particularly well. It does, it does still emit some light, uh, but it is, you know, a useful tool. Um, this is a flashlight. It doesn't have a ding or anything. Its batteries are just a little unreliable. So, um, you know, as long as you get it on, it works uh, just fine. But you did manage to find a flashlight. Awesome. Martin is wandering around and taking a look down uh, one of the aisles. You notice that at the end of the aisle that you're at, there is a case, uh, uh, but it has metal, uh, it has like a metal door on it. 
Uh, so it's got kind of like metal bars. Um, and it looks like someone has tried to pry it open in the past, but has failed to do so. Um, and inside, you can clearly make out an electric chainsaw. Uh, I think he's going to kind of call everybody over to gather around him and he'll say, does anybody have uh, like a crowbar or something? Yeah, yeah, right here, right here, right here. And he pulls it off of his sad looking broken tool belt. <laughs> yeah. Beat up tool, yeah, tool belt. <laughs> Martin has a uh, sledgehammer, but that seems like a little bit of overkill for that. Like that seems more like for breaking down a door than trying to pry <clears throat> open a <laughs> case. So, um, you call everyone over, and and you're about to break out your crowbar to try and get this this door open. Um, but you 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 did call everyone over. And once everyone yeah, arrives, he did raise his voice. And... Once everyone arrives, everybody's sitting there and you're talking, and he's like, "Yeah, I got a, I got a crowbar," and uh, that is when all of you notice that the sound of people walking didn't end when you all got there. It continued, and just two aisles down from you, come walking out of the aisle, are a pair of shambling corpses. So, we are about to enter combat. Um, so, the way this is going to work, everybody, is combat in Hopefinder works just like it does in really every other RPG. Um, what's going to happen here is uh, I am going to keep a running uh, kind of combat total here in my uh, notes program. So, uh, the first thing we're going to do is have everyone bounce perception for initiative there's no surprise here this zombie was too noisy um as a matter of fact this is a shambler so it kind of groans and shuffles as it walks and really has almost no chance of surprising anyone it's it's a little too noisy of a zombie to just sneak up on anybody um some that's not true but these ones no chance uh so i'm going to ask everyone to go ahead and roll perception for initiative i'm going to go ahead and do that for the zombies as well um we are not going to use a battle map or grid or anything like that for this. We're going to keep it all kind of theater of the mind. And as such, these zombies are near, but not close to you. Close is, close is for melee. Near, they're about 20 to 30 feet away. They're a move action away. Um, and there are a pair of these shamblers that have come walking around the end of the, the hall uh, and are making their way toward you. So uh, I'm going to just go around the horn and ask everyone to tell me what their initiative scores are, um, and I will go ahead and record them. So, uh, Danny, what does Danny have? Uh, 13 for an 18. Okay. Uh, 18 for Danny. Romero, what does Romero have? Uh, 17. Very good. What does Martin have? Uh, Good Martin old GD has a 22. Ooh. 22 for GD. That's very good. And what is Chris? On the die. <laughs> what does Chris have? Oh, uh, you beat my 21, sir. 21. Well, you're all going to beat these poor hapless shamblers who are slowly making their way around the end of the hallway here. Um they are uh uh coming towards you but uh uh, grave digger, good old Martin Holloway, just finishing up his story, coming from the top ropes, gets to go first. Uh, he is going to, uh, first he's going to say, we don't know how many more are here, no guns. And then he is going to, I'm assuming as with Pathfinder, he can draw his weapon as he's striding. So uh, no, actually, that uh, is a separate oh. action. You get three actions, okay. uh, but you, if you want to draw right, a weapon, then in that case, to... uh, his first action then is going to be to draw his sledgehammer from his back, uh -oh. uh, which is in the kind of quick equip thing as a weapon. Yep. Uh, then he is going to stride up to the closest of the shamblers. Yep. And then for his final action, he is going to take a single swing at them with his sledgehammer. All right. Which unfortunately so, is a martial weapon, so he doesn't get quite as good of a bonus, but 
So uh, Martin unsheathed this giant sledgehammer, which has clearly seen work in the past. It's the head of it's pretty pretty dirty, uh, and uh, goes marching up to these pair of shamblers. Uh, they're they're kind of staggered. One's a few feet in front of the other, but that's fine. You make your way up to the first one, and go ahead and swing. Go ahead and make an attack. Seventeen. That is a. 17 and i only get a plus two for this because it, i don't have martial proficiency but that is a 19 on the die so 19 19 total yes or 19 total i mean sorry right. so, so uh <laughs> you bring the sledgehammer down it slams into the zombie that is a hit it's not a critical hit but it is a hit so go ahead and roll damage that is a 2d6 That is seven points of bludgeoning damage against this zombie. All right. So zombie number one is going to take seven points of damage. Um, so, yeah, you um, you bring the hammer down on this thing and it it the hammer slams into its shoulder and it hits with kind of a sickening crunch. You're pretty sure some of its old rotten bones have broken. Um, but that was not enough to take it out. Shamblers are... Uh, a little tough. Um, so uh, that is the end of Martin's turn. Next up, Chris, uh, it is your turn to act. What do you got for me, Chris? Yeah, uh, Chris, you said uh, the shamblers are two aisles away. Are these aisles in good enough shape as to obstruct vision providing cover? Can he shoot from where he's at within... Uh, you know, 30 feet range of his pistol. So think of these uh, aisles as, you know, they're about five or six feet tall shelving units um, that okay. generally speaking have stuff piled even on top. So if you're down an aisle, you cannot shoot into the next aisle. Um, but you're at the end of the aisles and they're kind of coming around the end of the aisles at you. So think of yourself kind of at the, the back wall of the store. Um, so that's kind of the situation. You could... Uh, like move to the the edge of the aisle and shoot around the corner. Okay. Yeah. Uh, he's gonna do that. Martin said no guns, and Chris is going to flatly ignore that. Uh, <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> he he has a minus one strength peek behind the curtain, uh, yeah. so he's not getting anywhere near those things. Hopefully, uh, sure. and because he has a holster that lets him draw his pistol as a free action. There you go. So he can stride around to the corner. Uh, quickly draw his revolver and instead of firing twice he's going to use the aim action for his second action to try okay. and make this one count and see if we can't take down the one that's already injured so hope finder does have an action in it called aim uh, in aim uh, you basically spend an action to just line up your shot and it gives you a plus one bonus on your next so uh, you go ahead and aim, and with your third action, you squeeze off a shot. Uh, pretty good, uh, but the same total. So 19 total. I know it's not a crit, but that should but be But it a is hit. a hit. Are you are you firing at the same one that uh, that uh, Gravedigger is, is working on? Yes, so I was hoping to remove a combatant from the battlefield. Sure, absolutely. Um, so go ahead and roll damage with your uh, uh, revolver. Yeah, it's a D10 piercing. All right. Uh, oh, only three. I hope <laughs> hope Martin did a real good number on him. The sledgehammer is a very effective tool at crushing zombies. Bullets, they can be a bit hit or miss. If you get a crit, they are fantastic. Uh, but if you miss, it's more like, or just get a score regular hit, it tends to be more of a flesh wound, Yeah, especially when it comes to zombies. So um, this hit is going to stagger it. It's going to knock it back a bit. But frankly, shooting a zombie in a chest is not that effective. Um, but it still did some damage. Uh, the zombie yeah. is still up and moving. That is the end of Chris's turn. Next up, we have Danny Pauly. Danny Pauly. <clears throat> Pardon me. Danny Pauly. He's also going to ignore his um, gigantic friend's advice and take one action to draw, one action to aim, and one action to shoot. All right. Uh, 
So I'm going to roll here, a plus one circumstance. Ooh, but that, that is not going to help an eight off the die, is it? So that is a nine plus five. Yeah, that's 14 in total as he shoots off his pocket pistol. A uh, 14 is still going to hit, though, because these these shamblers are notoriously <clears throat> slow and not very not very quick on their feet. Uh, so they they don't they don't dodge attacks. They just pretty much take them. They they allow their hit points to take the, to dodge <laughs> attacks, um, which is why they can be kind of tough, just because they got a fair number of hit points. Um, so that is going to hit. Go ahead and roll damage. Oh, looks like a little bit of my castmates' luck are rubbing off here. I rolled a six <laughs> on the d6, so that is six points of damage there. So this zombie is looking really badly beat up at this point in time. The that shot blows off part of its cheek. Um, and it's, it like, you were this close to having that go center line and maybe take out the brain stem, which would have knocked it out. Uh, but in this case, you just messed it up real bad. Um, it does look very badly hurt, but it is still standing. Uh, so that was all of Danny's turn. He drew, he aimed, he fired. That's a pretty typical turn. Uh, and lastly, uh, we got Romero. You all beat the zombies. The zombies are going super slow. So uh, you all beat the zombies. Romero, it is over to you. All right. Well, Romero, I think, is of the opinion that when Gravedigger says no guns, it means no guns. Um, so he's going to run up and he's still got the flashlight in one hand. On the other hand, he's wearing a pair of brass knuckles. And um, nice. he's just he's going to try to just punch this zombie right in the face. He's going to cold cock the zombie. That'll yeah. do it. <laughs> Um, four on the die for a total of a 10. So, uh, you, you swing as hard as you can, but, uh, your over exuberance just comes up a bit short. Um, however, because you were wearing the brass knuckles, you do still have one action left. All right. Um, so he's going to take another strike, try to make up for um, sure. that absolute failure. Missed with um, the first, try with the second. Uh, yeah, it's, it's even worse. It's an eight total. <laughs> <laughs> this so is Romero, exactly what i would expect romero comes up and and in his bravest move attempts to uh punch the zombie uh but does not manage to connect both times uh you do actually kind of hit the zombie it just didn't appear to do anything it was kind of like punching it in the shoulder and it doesn't seem to care about that at all um so that is the end of your turn Next up, the Shamblers go. We've got a Shambler that is in close contact with both uh, Martin and Romero. Uh, it is going to attempt to attack Martin. Martin was the first person who came up to it. So the first thing it's going to do is attack with its fist. So let me go ahead and make this attack roll against Martin. Okay, I'm going to wager that an 8 does not hit. Uh, it, uh, uh, it does not uh, question though do yeah. I have to state that I'm doing my reaction before you give the uh, yes. assuming I'd have to state it before you gave the yeah yeah, yeah. So I was so, full on so, the draw on that one but I'm yeah, no worries. okay with that since it was a miss anyway <laughs> yeah so uh, that one's going to yeah. be a miss it does try and attack you again if you want to use your reaction now yeah if it does try to do it again I am going to use my dodge reaction alright so that's going to give you a plus 3 to your AC um, yes. Oh, it may make the difference. We'll see. I rolled really well, uh, but that is going to be an 18. I rolled a 19 on the uh, die. That is just barely over it because my taking the reaction brought it up to a 17. So that is a hit. So it's it's it you 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 try and roll back with the punch just like you were taught all those years ago, and you were this close, but somehow. Uh, it did manage to connect with you. So that is going to deal a little bit of damage to you. We'll see. Um, so it's four. Four points of damage. So in Hope Finder, armor doesn't give you a huge bonus to your AC, but it does give you resistance to damage. So what's the resistance? What's your resistance value for the armor you are wearing? Uh, my resistance value is a three, and it resists bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing. Okay, so I just dealt four bludgeoning to you, which means you're going to take one point of damage, and that's also going to ding your armor because your armor uh, uh, failed to protect you from the attack. So mark a ding on your armor and take one point of damage. Now, 
for those of you at home, it's like, wow, that means that you're, you're not going to take a lot of damage quickly. Yeah, but Hope Finder characters don't have a lot of hit points. So, so yeah. damage is something you generally want to avoid when mm -hmm. you have single digit hit points. Um, so uh, that was the first zombie's turn. The second zombie shambles up to Romero. Now, it was close to you, but it was not right next to you. So it is going to spend one of its actions to move. Uh, and then with its second action, it's just going to swing a fist at you, uh, Romero. Here I'm it comes. Use the the dodge reaction with no special bonus, but okay. So that's going to give you a plus two. Ah, I rolled terribly. I only got a seven. Uh, that's definitely going to miss. Uh, the zombie comes up to you and awkwardly, awkwardly swings at you. Now, that said, there's one more zombie. Um, so, uh, let's see, Chris, you went down the aisle to kind of hide and shoot around the corner, correct? I would say strategically place himself, but yes. Absolutely. Down the aisle that you went down, there is a crawler. Um, and it was attracted by the sound of your gunshot and it spends its first action crawling up to you. It only gets, uh, let's see, it is going to only get two actions per round. It's slow. Not all zombies are slow, but this one is. So it's going to take its first action to crawl up at you, and the second action it's going to attempt to uh, uh, grab hold of you, uh, hit you with its fist to grab hold of you. Ah, dodge. All right. Ooh, I'm not sure the dodge is going to make a difference. I got a total of 21, because I rolled Ooh. very well. Yeah, uh, no. But dodge brings it up to a 19, which felt pretty confident. So it, it is going to hit you. Um, but let's see if it manages to do any damage. It doesn't do a lot of damage. It's a pretty weak creature. Pretty weak zombie. It's only going to do two. Okay. Uh, the bulletproof vest that Chris is wearing has resistance five. Wow. So if, if he didn't wake up with three bruises, he'd be feeling a okay. But now I'm, I'll be up to four bruises. Correct. So when armor totally prevents you from taking any damage, you instead take a bruise. So in this case, uh, Chris takes a bruise from the hit. The zombie does not otherwise harm you. And that is the end of the zombie's turn. So uh, that was the, the one crawler and the two shamblers have both gone. That's where we're at. The party is in a life or death struggle against a, a couple pretty average zombies, but we'll see how it goes. We're going to start back at the top of the order with Gravedigger. The zombie in front of you looks very badly hurt. The other one is now also in melee range. So you mm -hmm. and Romero are in melee with both of these two shamblers. Uh, and we have Jeff, uh, sorry, Chris is back there uh, in melee with a crawler and Danny's kind of off to the side. <laughs> uh, I think Martin is going to try to finish this one off. And then if he's still got actions after, he'll start working on the one that's uh, menacing Romero. So he is going to take a swing at the one in front of him. All right. I wish I rolled this good on the pod. Uh, that is a 19 on the die for a 21. A 21 is a, a very solid hit. Um, not quite a crit, very close to a crit, but not quite. Um, so go ahead and roll damage on that. This shambler is in pretty yeah. bad shape as it is. Um, let's see what happens when it takes another hit from this I, sledgehammer. I hope it's in really bad shape because that's two ones on my 2d6 oh, so no. with my strength modifier. That is minimum four damage. So you come swinging in with the sledgehammer and it clips the zombie's shoulder. And for a moment you thought, oh no, this isn't going to do it. But the, 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 the sledgehammer clips its shoulder and hits it right in the neck. And you just hear a kind of solid crack. And with that, the zombie collapses to the ground and stops moving. You have dispatched one of the, the, the shamblers. Um, it, it goes down in a, a sack of rotten flesh. That was only your first action, though. Yep. So for his uh, second action, he's going to turn his attention to the uh, one that Romero tried to punch at All right. and take a swing at it. Uh that is going to be a bit lower. That is only going to be a 12 to hit. A 12 does still hit. These things do not have a good armor class. 
Um, so that is going to hit. Go ahead and give me damage as you bring the sledgehammer around and slam it into the, the second zombie. Okay, that is a much better damage roll that time. That is almost max. That is 13 points of bludgeoning damage. Oh. Your your sledgehammer slams into this thing so hard that one of its arms just shatters. The rotten meat just kind of comes undone. This zombie looks horribly hurt by that. It is still up. It does still have one arm that it can make an attack with. Uh, but, you know, it's it's not going to be a concert pianist anytime soon. Uh, because one of its arms is now mangled beyond recognition. Um, you do still have one action left, but with that multiple attack penalty, you're going to be looking at a pretty hard hit. I do want to say that yep. even though we're doing kind of theater of the mind here, you could also spend an action to put it in a flanking position so that Romero has an easier time to hit. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think that is actually what he's going to do then is he's just going to kind of move around to the other side of it because I'd have to roll pretty high on that last one to actually hit. All right. So. All right. So uh, with, with, you know, practice grace for such a for such a big guy you actually are very kind of nimble um, yeah he's fairly <clears throat> like light on his feet for his size yeah you kind of move around to the back side of the thing it doesn't even really pay attention to you it's too busy like doesn't even really pay attention to its shattered arm it's still just reaching out towards romero with its with its gnarled fingers and that is the end of gravedigger's turn martin's turn uh, next up, Chris, you've got a crawler that's come out of nowhere on you. Yeah, uh, as a free action, he'll say, got a crawler that's come out of nowhere on me. Uh, and then I don't... Does firing in melee still provoke attacks of opportunity? And hopefully no, that's we're... that's only Not in... in uh, that's... Yeah. So oh, okay. in, in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, uh, creatures only get attack of opportunity if they say they get attack of opportunity. Not everybody has it. Um, that is the <laughs> same in Hopefinder because, again, Hopefinder is a hack of Pathfinder 2nd Edition, so it uses all the P2 rules except for where it says it's different. So in this case, um, that is kind of the standard. Now, you're going to wager that a crawler is not a highly trained combat machine and probably doesn't have attack of opportunity. But Fair. you don't know. Okay, well, I guess I'll find out. Uh, Chris will spend his first action again to aim, really hoping to get a crit on this one, uh, and will pull the trigger right in this crawler's face. All right. And that's a natural 20. Oh! oh. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, with the aim, that brings it up to a 27. So that is a critical hit with a piercing uh, attack. Now... In Hopefinder, uh, all attacks, critical hits are especially deadly. Um, and generally speaking, most guns have the deadly trait. I'm assuming this your gun does. does have the deadly trait. Okay, so the deadly trait means that it deals triple damage on a critical hit. Um, and if you exceed the target's AC by 20, not 10, but by 20, it's an auto kill. They just go down. Uh, but I'm going to wager this isn't by 20. What's your total bonus come out to? Uh, that only came out to a 27, so... You're not far Nothing. off, but it's not It's not going to be enough. So, But you are going to get triple damage, which is probably going to result in the same thing anyway. You would also get the piercing critical effect, which is uh, crits from piercing weapons cause the target to be sickened until the target receives some healing. Zombies are immune to sicken, so it does, the oh. piercing hits on zombies aren't special. But uh, you're still getting triple damage. So go ahead and roll damage and then multiply it by three. Uh, then that becomes nine. Only nine. roll a three again on a D10. Nine is still pretty pretty decent damage against a crawler. Um, it looks really badly hurt by that. Um, it is still moving, but you put a bullet right in the back of its spine and like parts of it are now no longer functioning. Um, you do still have one action left. Yeah, uh, and seeing as how easy this thing was to hit, why not? Why not just shoot again? No shoot aim, again? but we'll see what happens. All right. Ah, yeah, I spoke too soon. That was a two off the dice for a three with that multiple attack penalty. So not quite. you you fire wildly a second time, desperate to put the crawler down, but the bullet just hits the floor right next to it and does not hit. The thing is still alive, but only just. 
Um, let's go on now to Danny. Danny, you've got a crawler off to your left in the in the aisle that is menacing Chris, and you've still got a shambler that's up in front of you uh, attacking Romero. Um, and all you can smell is rot and 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 terrible rotten flesh as it pours down upon you from both sides. What do you do? Sniffs the air and he's like, Homan Castle never changes. And then just walks <laughs> walks on over to his friend Chris, seeing that Romero and Martin seem to have that in hand. Um, and uh, just sort of boondock saints behind Chris with the <laughs> extended and uh, shoots down at the crawler. Let's All right. see how this looks for me here. Okay, that's an 11 off the die. So I, I didn't intentionally aim with my highest. So that's a 16 to hit. 16 does hit. So go ahead and roll damage on that. The bullet sinks into zombie flesh. Let's see how well it does. All right, and that is a four off the die. Four, you put it right in the back of the crawler's head. It slams its head down on the ground and it stops moving. The crawler is dead. Um, so you managed to kill the crawler. All right. Um, yeah. Um, we, I guess, uh, since I'm kind of far away, uh, free action, you know, looks at Chris for a moment and says, clean up aisle three. <laughs> the end of Danny's turn. All right. So Danny starts cracking wise. Uh, the, uh, the, the zombies are dead. Uh, you know what? Uh, thanks to your cracking wise, I'm going to go ahead and give everyone an extra point of hope. Uh, so uh, instead of your starting amount of hope, which you should have had three, by the way, uh, you now have a fourth point of hope. Everybody should know that hope works like hero points in, in Hope Finder, uh, but you can spend it in a couple different ways. One, you can use it to reroll a roll that's failed. That's the obvious one. Another way you can use it, though, is to turn a critical hit from a bad guy into a normal hit. Super valuable use of hope in hope finder and the final thing you can do with it is if you find yourself unconscious you can spend a point of hope to skip making your dying check uh that round you don't stabilize you just get to skip making the check that's all it does for you while you're dying so it's not quite as good while you're dying but you can use it in other ways another important aspect of hope is should you find yourself infected with the z plague the Z Plague drains your hope one point per day until you're out. And if you run out of hope, that's how you succumb to the zombie parasite and turn into a zombie. Or at least progress to the next stage, which is incurable, and you're on the quick slide to being a zombie. So um, we don't have to worry about that right now, but because of your wisecracking, I'm going to award everyone in the group a point of hope. I appreciate that. Um, so everybody has four right now might prove useful here in the ongoing don't forget that you have those and if you really want to hit on a thing or you think it's critical don't forget to use them all right uh that was the end of danny's turn we're up to romero romero you know that the zombie goes next make a count what do you got for me all right he's standing in front of a zombie and has the guy who's at least a foot taller than him and probably more than twice his weight on the other side of the zombie um he clearly embarrassed himself last time out but he's just going to wind up with that set of brass knuckles and try to punch this thing's head off like it's Don Flamenco and punch out. <laughs> All right. That is, with the flanking, a total of a 21. 21 is going to hit your, 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 uh, with the, with the flank, your, your, your brass knuckles managed to find home. Uh, again, not quite a crit, just shy of being a crit, uh, but that is going to be a hit. So go ahead and give me some damage with those brass knuckles. Uh, three damage on the brass knuckles. Three damage to the shambler. Uh, that is gonna knock its 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 head back a bit, but that is not enough to kill it. It is still up. It looks pretty badly beat after after it took that sledgehammer hit and the right. punch, but it's still up. I'm gonna swing again with the multi attack penalty. Uh, no. No, that's not going to hit that time. Actually, I'll spend a hope to re-roll since we just All right. Yeah, there we go. That. Handy yeah. reminder that uh, always comes into, well, yeah, we might as well spend a hope. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 22 this time. A 22. A there we go. That is going to wow, hit. That's after the minus five. Yeah. That's impressive. That is a, he, that is a very high roll. Um, he's a finesse guy. Oh, that's sure. a finesse weapon. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah, that's what's not, that's a nice one about the knuckles. 
Yeah, you can you can use them uh, as a finesse weapon. Um, so that is a critical hit. Now this is a critical hit with a bludgeoning weapon, and it doesn't have the deadly trait, so it's only going to do double damage. Uh, so go ahead and deal double damage. Bludgeoning attacks uh, deal a bruise uh, on a critical hit, uh, but uh, zombies uh, don't care about bruises. So, uh... <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's a total of six then, doubling six. The, the D4. So, so you reel back and slam your fist into this zombie's face, and just its jaw just rips right off. Um, and the thing sputters for a moment before collapsing to the ground in a pile of rotten meat. That is the end of combat. You have killed all three of these zombies. Not too worse for wear. Um, you know, you took a you took a couple minor scrapes and a bruise. Uh, but uh, other than that, not too bad. Your first encounter with zombies here in the mall went just just fine. Uh, after after dealing with the the second shambler, you kind of stop, take uh, stock of the situation, and uh, realize that that was it. You don't hear any other footfalls calling, growing closer. Everything appears to be okay. So uh, that's where we're at. Dan Danny's gonna take stock of everybody else in the group and probably settle his his sunken eyes on Chris and go, oof. <laughs> You don't look so good. You should you should sit down. Um <laughs> Martin, do you still want this? He holds out the uh the the crowbar as he's sort of examining his patient. Well, uh now that we know for sure there's Z's in here. Well, we can always take it back to the camp, but uh it might not be the best thing to use while we're still in here, but yeah. Let's see if we can pry that bad boy open. All right. So um, you're going to have to break open this case. It is it is pretty solid, but you can basically uh, try and bash it open. So the way that that kind of works here in Hope Finder is that there is a function of the athletic skill that is uh, batter. And basically what you're doing is you're trying to batter open a thing and deal dings to it. So um, the way this works, a crowbar is particularly a good tool for battering things open. That's why you take it as a, as a, as a piece of item. Very useful item to have. So who is going to make an athletics check against this? And uh, why don't you go ahead and roll? Whoever that is. I think I got a plus five, so I'm assuming I probably have the highest athletic <laughs> Probably, yeah. Who are we, we gonna see? Use? So... Who are we gonna have pride open? The ex wrestler. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think uh he'll kind of hold his hand out and Danny will slap the crowbar into his hand and he'll wedge it in there. And oh that <laughs> well a thirteen is no longer the lowest roll I've had on this die. Uh oh. that was a natural one. <laughs> oh no. So that is a uh that so, is a six, which I don't know if batter because it isn't technically an attack. Oh, it it uh, actually does that fall is under an the cat. Is it yeah. considered an attack roll? Oh, so, so that it, does fall under <laughs> critical yeah. fail territory. So, then, so when you critically fail with an attack roll with a tool or a weapon, the tool or weapon takes a ding. So uh, whoever's crowbar that is just took a ding. Uh, I don't <laughs> think that's enough. To make it not functional, uh, I'm sure it has, it has what, four? It's four. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I think so four, it, yeah. It's okay. It's only going to take one. So as long as you don't critically fail again, it's yeah. going to be fine. But yeah, it's taken has, a day. He, yeah, he wedges it in there and he like goes and it actually like bends the crowbar a little bit. <laughs> yeah, this, as it turns out, this thing's actually really, really tough. But you can try again. Yeah. Yeah, so he gets it at a different angle. There we go. That is a 16 on the die that time for a 21. 21 is pretty good. Um, That is going to do two dings to the cabinet. That causes the cabinet to be broken, but it's not destroyed. So uh, this cabinet has four four dings as a as a kind of object. Um, it has four. Its break value is four. So a uh, two is going to be enough to pry it open to the point where you can get at some of the stuff that's in there. And reaching around inside there, you can tell that below 
So the top of the thing has kind of these iron bars, which is where you can see the chainsaw. But the bottom part of it has some stuff in it too. And looking around in there, you do, uh, you can feel around and you find a small box of ammunition. There is a box nice. of pistol ammo down in here. Um, nice. It looks like this is also where they kept the, the ammo and supplies. It's not labeled as such, but this is where they keep those mm -hmm. things. Uh, uh, so you do find a small box of pistol ammo. So that's 10 uh, pistol bullets um, that you can uh, pass, pass that around. back to Chris. And uh, in addition, the, it also looks like there's batteries down in here. Um, it looks oh, like there cool. is one large battery that you can't get out unless you destroy the, the, the case. And there are uh, 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 two small batteries, which would allow you to fix the one in the flashlight, the, the flashlight you found. Those you can. Yeah, yeah, so he'll hand those back to Romero then. All right. And then I think he's going to try one more time to see if he can knock this thing the rest of the way open. Okay. Uh, that is a. That is an 11. Uh, so that is a 16. So a 16 is not quite enough to get this cabinet to crack open. You're going to need to either try again or or give up. Um, that wasn't enough. Oh, Drew, are you taking a plus two from the crowbar for this? Oh, I was not taking a plus two from the crowbar. Uh, so I the plus completely two is, forgot about that. So. The plus two is certainly going to help, but it's not going to help you here. It's not, not yeah, quite enough. It wouldn't be enough to get it to two dings. That would have yeah. brought it to uh, 17. Yeah. Or no, 18. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it, yes. You're, you're not quite hitting more. the DC. Uh, that's a 15 on the die, so that's a 22. And with that, the and I case... I imagine that'll finish it, yeah. <laughs> the case pops open. Uh, you manage to crack open the last bit on the door. Um, this reveals that, lo and behold, you now have a chainsaw. Uh, the chainsaw is a uh, terrifying martial melee weapon. Um, <laughs> it is very, very dangerous. Um, this thing does require fuel, this is an electric chainsaw, though, so it runs off large batteries. There is a large battery in here. Um, but I'm going to tell you right now, just looking at it, this battery is pretty old and probably doesn't have most of its charge left. So mm -hmm. you don't know how exactly long it's going to last, but if you decide to fire up the chainsaw, you will have a chainsaw for at least a little bit. <laughs> mm -hmm. And now, was that second battery we found down the bottom like another one of that size battery? Uh, that... So the battery that the chainsaw that was on display had no battery in it. Um, oh, so that's so the battery we're talking about. Okay. The battery yes. down below is what you gotcha. need. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, okay. And in addition to that, you find a, uh, down below there is also a machinery kit. Um, this is uh, a bunch of machinery tools. Um, it's kind of a heavy thing, so I don't know if anybody wants to carry it. It does have a, a bulk of, of two. Yeah. All right. So uh, you've you've managed to loot uh, the 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 home and castle. Now you could spend more time in here looting for more stuff, uh, but you're on a mission. So um, you know, up to you. Where do you go next? Probably go to head out to the mall proper after All this. Right. Yeah, head out into the uh, atrium. All right. So let's go ahead and bring back up the map here. Uh, let's go ahead and make the token appear. There it is. Uh, so you make your way now towards the mall entrance proper. Uh, you make your way through the rest of Home and Castle and uh, soon find yourself at the entrance to the mall proper, the, the interior of the mall. And you're looking in and uh, looking into this mall, uh, you can see that there is light here because it looks like the interior of the mall has skylights. And it looks like over the years, most of those skylights have broken. And you can tell this because... Uh, rainwater has poured in, and the inside of the mall almost looks kind of like a terrarium in places. Where the skylights have broken open, moss and, and uh, in some cases, small plants have started growing in the center of the aisles. Um, you are on the bottom floor of the mall. There are two floors. You're right near an, an escalator that probably hasn't moved in a decade um, that goes up between the floors, and that is the area where there's kind of an opening uh, that you can see up and you can see the skylight. And beneath it, there's also kind of a recessed area that looks like it used to be like a child's playland 
kind of thing. Um, you get here, and the there there looks like there was kind of a crude barricade put here at the entrance to Homan Castle, but it's it looked like it was overran forever ago, and it's just destroyed. Um, you are looking into the place proper now. Off to the left, um, you see a place called Spikes. Um, that looks like the type of place that sells gag gifts and like adult edgy clothing. Uh, off to your right, there is a place called My Precious, which looks like a jewelry store of some sort. Uh, further in, um, you see a place on the right called Engol Sports, um, which looks like a sporting supply place. Off to the left, uh, a little further in, you see something that looks called Candle Hell. Um, and looks like it's a place that sells candles and perfumes and stuff. Um, no sign of that toy store yet, but far off in the distance, uh, towards the center of the mall. So if you look kind of towards the middle there, where there is that, uh, kind of octagon and the Santa hat, you can see from here that there is this crooked Christmas tree. Doesn't look like it was real, uh, but it's been here for 10 years. Um, and it's crooked because the guide wires that were holding it up snapped long ago. And it's just kind of leaning over, framing this kind of rotten, ruined Christmas village. You just see this kind of gross mold and mildew covered uh, Santa's village kind of thing. And as you look at it, uh, you're kind of looking into this mall and it's kind of dark. All the stores are dark and, and closed off because none of them have windows. So who knows what's lurking in And somewhere far off in the mall, you hear, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> And that is where we are going to end the first part of our playthrough of Hope Finder. <laughs> Gentlemen, I want to thank you for playing in this fun-filled event. This has been a blast. I hope you have had a good time as well. For those of you watching at home, we will be airing part two. Uh, I believe that'll be dropping both as a podcast uh, on the Pod Against the Machine, and I will be dropping uh, the video of it on my YouTube channel. So if you want to catch part two of this exciting uh, Pinecrest Mall exploration here playing Hope Finder, we hope you tune into that. And for all of you playing, uh, watching here at uh, third Party Con, I want to thank you for your support of third party publishers. It means the world to us. At Paizo, we really value our third party publishers. Uh, they are part of the lifeblood of our games, and we do greatly appreciate them. Before I go, I want to toss it around the horn and let everybody uh, say where they can find out more about you and your podcast, and uh, then you can toss it back to me and I'll close it out. Um. Well, uh, I, I'm part of Pot Against the Machine. I, I don't use much, if any, social media, but I'm also the least funny one. So you're not <laughs> missing out on much. Um, but yeah, you can you can always listen to us. We have new episodes every Wednesday. And uh, we also like to play some games that are not Pathfinder winny. And thank you so much, Jason. This has been this has been so great. I really Good appreciate it. Thank you. Sam. Yeah. Um, echoing Zach, um, you can also find me on Pot Against the Machine, weirdly enough. Um, you can find us at potagainstthemachine.com, uh, where we have the slowest website in the history of the world. But there is some good stuff on there. Uh, we also periodically do stuff uh, that we're calling the Story Machine, where we have uh, little like audio fiction things in addition to actual play. And um, you can find us on Twitter and most other things at Pod versus Machine, uh, where we tweet and you know to do the social media stuff badly <laughs> fantastic uh, and as i said at the beginning i'm Jero. uh again listen to me on the pod uh i also ran our uh, second uh mcfib which was uh a call of cthulhu uh that we will hopefully finish up at some point eventually uh <laughs> And I occasionally uh, stream video games on the Pod's uh, Twitch channel, which is uh, Podverse and the Scene, same as our uh, Twitter handle and most of our other social media. Uh, Jeff? Yeah, weirdly enough, also uh, you can find me on Pod Against the Machine. Uh, I ran our uh, Pathfinder 2nd Edition one shot, Sundered Waves, written by our uh, fabulous narrator fun, here. Fun, fun. Uh, so if you want to hear us just 
really do badly at the rules of Pathfinder 2e, check out that four part one shot. <laughs> uh, and yeah, we're we're on Twitter. Uh, you can find me on Mastodon at dice.camp uh, at Ready to Action. Uh, and yeah, thanks uh, for running this for us, Jason. You are more than welcome. I want to thank you all for playing. I am Jason Bullman. I'm the director of game design at Paizo and the publisher at uh, Minotaur Games. If you are interested in learning more about Hope Finder, you can find it on Kickstarter right now. Uh, just go to Kickstarter and search for Hope Finder. We'll make sure to get a link associated with this as well. If you're excited about the Pinecrest Mall Holiday Horror, releasing this as a flyer mini adventure is a stretch goal as part of the campaign. We hope we get there. Uh, you can take your uh, characters, your survivors on this adventure too. Thank you for watching everybody and we will see you next time.